two paranormal stories involving creatures that hunt the darkness around Christmas. One true crime murder spree that forever changed Christmas for an entire city. And then a Christmas conspiracy. One that may have led not only to the destruction of an entire race, but those people were most likely my ancestors. Today, on the extra long episode, Christmas episode, of Dead Rabbit Radio. Ho, 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 ho! Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the, the, the Christmas episode. I, it's not just another episode, it's the Christmas episode of Dead Rabbit Radio. I'm your host, Jason Carpenter. I'm having a great day. I hope you're having a great day too. You know what's funny is I actually started going back. I've been doing it for probably about two or three weeks now and listening to the podcast at work. And I've gotten some, one of the reviews someone left on, I think it was Spotify or something like that. They said, it's a really good show. It's well put together. The guy has kind of a interesting way to present stuff he goes episodes are a little short though and i was like a little short i mean i get that most podcasts are longer but as i've been listening back to the podcast it does seem short like i think i spend the right amount of time per topic but each episode leaves you wanting a little bit more which is good which i like that but this episode no time limits there will it will be heavily edited but there i'm not going to set my nine minute timer to my stories i got four for you all christmas related and first off though I'm going to open some presents. So I hope you join me for this. My mom sent me a box of presents. I opened two of them already. I told them I'd save... This is obviously being recorded before Christmas Day, but I told her I'd save them, but I already opened two of them. One of them was a pair of really nice... Ther- well, it was actually two pairs of really nice thermal socks. Up in Hood River, it's gotten really, really cold up here, so I'm glad I opened those early. Yesterday, I decided to open another one. It's a flannel hat. Now, here's a little personal note. There's currently a hat war going on. These uh, two, two, two women have bought me competing hats. Well, to be fair, one woman just bought me a really nice flannel hat I've had for years, and another woman decided she would buy me the exact same hat, simply newer and a different color. So the hat war began. And I, you know, my mom's hat's really nice, but it's a hat war. What am I going to do? Okay, I'm going to open this one up here. The, I got some, a family of snowmen. Dude, they had a lot of kids. Wait a second. There's a snowman. There, there's three, two big snowmen. I think that's a snowwoman. Maybe that's the dad and that's the older brother. Or maybe this is some kind of non-traditional family. They got three kids. I'm assuming that's a woman because she doesn't, I don't know. I just get the feeling it's a woman. Okay. Let's see what we got here. What is, whoa. Oh, this is pretty dope, dude. It's a, looks like a burka. Oh, it's a balaclava, a balaclava, yeah, but it's like, I was like, my mom wouldn't buy me a burka. It's kind of like like a half burka, I guess. I think it's too big. Here, I'm going to try it on real quick. Oh, yeah, dude, it's like a Swiss tech. It's a little thing because it's super hot. I hope my headphones will fit. Yeah, my headphones should be able to fit under it. That's always the key thing because... Or, oh, dude, I could put my ears back like that. That'll definitely be warmer. Thanks, Mama. I hate the cold. We've been over that. Snow, No snow zone. It's supposed to snow, like, a ton up here right now. Okay. And I got... That's a card, and that's a card. This is a bill for my cable company. I got one more gift here. I'm going to open this guy up. Compelling podcasting, I know, guys. It's a Walmart gift card, which is actually one of the things I asked for. Dude. $75 Walmart gift card. That's awesome. I'm going to buy some pants. Buy some nice warm jeans. You know what? It's funny. Because once I stop... I'm throwing presents away. That's where I'm back. Is Once you stop gaming, once you stop playing video games, you have so much money. You have so much money to spend on other stuff. I used to game a lot. Oh, You want me to read the card? Uh, no, that's personal. I'm not going to read the card. Okay. And then I got another card. My mom's a card person, and I am a card receiver. I hang them up. Let's see what we got in this last card here. 
So the first one had a picture of a little baby in a manger. A little baby in a manger with a little sparkly sun. That's cute. And this one is a more traditional picture of the manger painting. Mama, what the heck is this? It's a receipt for a bunch of candy she bought. I don't know why this is in here. Stag chili, beef chili. My mom doesn't buy chili. I don't think so, unless she's making some sort of stew. This, this is some sort of coded message from my mom. Super bizarre. Why is this in here? Anyways, I will read this card. Dear Jason, have a wonderful Christmas and a happy new year. See you soon, because I'm going to go visit them. Love, Mom. She always draws little smiley faces. Dear Jason, let us rejoice on the day Christ was born. Love always, Mom. Aww. It's a nice card. I like that. I got a $15 gift card to Dairy Queen. So I will go use that tomorrow because I'm currently not on my keto diet. So I gotta, I'll just have like three blizzards tomorrow and call it a day. I took it off for the vacation. Okay, thanks, mom. That baklava is gonna be dope, dude. That's gonna be super warm, super super warm. Okay, why did she put include a receipt in there? That's so bizarre. That's so funny. Okay, so there we go with that. Christmas Christmas presents are opened up. I'm I'm glad I actually opened this up early. So I can use that DQ card before I go, okay, back on my keto diet. And then I opened this up and I was like, ah, can't, can't let it go to waste. I mean, I could save it, but that's not very American of me. Okay, let's go ahead and get started on the episode. And now, like I said, we got two paranormal monster stories, one true crime story and a conspiracy story. We're fulfilling the pledge of the show on this episode. First monster story, it's kind of tiny. Not a lot to it, but I thought it was interesting. It's actually like two sentences worth of stuff. In Iceland, so this kind of goes into bizarre Christmas traditions. that You'll find that a lot, except for the true crime. That's not a Christmas tradition, hopefully. But, you know, and I'm not going to talk about Krampus. Everybody knows about Krampus or Black Peter and all that stuff. Like, Krampus was cool when nobody knew about it. And, like, it was funny on The Office. But there's been, like, a ton of movies about him. So I wanted to find some other creepy and it's funny because a lot of christmas legends are creepy because and i think it's because of the whole winter solstice it's still kind of tied into the same time period as halloween things like that changing of the seasons death and violence anyways so in iceland they have this yule cat yule is a old-timey word for something but anyway so this cat's name is jollock Jollock Paturin. J- Jollock Paturin. And it's this, this this massive cat that hunts around in Iceland around this time of year. Now, he doesn't eat sinners, and he doesn't eat bad kids. He eats people who don't get new clothes for Christmas. That is quite the threat. It's funny because as a kid, you were always like, oh, socks. Thanks, Grandma. Like, you wanted, you know, Soundwave, or you wanted a... Oh, go see Bumblebee, by the way. But you wanted, like, a toy, and you got socks, and they're they're just being practical. But in Iceland, you'd be like, yay, socks, I'm not going to get eaten. Yay, Grandma, thank you. They're like, why don't you open that other toy? And they're like, no, I'm afraid that won't be enough new clothes for me. And so it's actually still a tradition where people have to wear new clothes. And when I say it's still a tradition, it's not like Macy's is like, buy your clothes before, before December 25th, otherwise you'll get eaten. Like, it's in rural societies. But... People want to wear their new clothes on Christmas time. And it's funny because it almost sounds like something that is 100% made up. Like some legends are kind of based on something. It sounds like something that a grandpa one time told a kid. It's like, why did grandma buy me socks? And he's like, uh, because you'll get eaten otherwise. And then the legend just grew from there. That's what I'm assuming. I don't know why a cat would care what type of clothes you were wearing. But apparently this one does. Yule cat. Meow. I should be bigger, so let's do a bigger... No. Don't eat me. I actually got new clothes. I got a baklava and socks and, uh, oh, the hat. My mom joined the hat war. Okay, the next one is a little more intriguing because these guys were spotted throughout southern Europe. They were spotted in countries from Greece to Bosnia. So this is a long-range myth and people are like oh no these things were totally real 
They're basically their Bigfoot because it lasted a huge period of time. I'm sure there are people who still believe in it. A huge period of time. Depending on what region you were in, they had a different tradition, but they all looked the same, which is kind of interesting. They're called the Cali Cant... The Cali Cant... God. The Cali Cant Zeros. The Cali Cant Zeros. We're going to call them Collies for short. Actually, that might be disrespectful towards the Indian religion. Let's call them Zaros for short. Okay, so these Zaros, they have a few things in common. They generally live underground. They're an underground creature. They have dark skin. They're short. They're smaller than humans. They look like humans, but across the cultures, the one thing that is persistent is they have tails. So from all the different countries that these guys are a part of, uh, Greece, Bulgaria, Serbia, Albania, Bosnia, and Cyprus, they're small humans with darker skin and they have tails. Now, some of those countries say, oh, no, they have donkey ears as well. And other people say that they have feet. They don't have human feet, <laughs> that they just have feet. And the other countries are like, what's a foot? No, it's, some of the countries say they don't have feet, but they have like hooves or whatever. So some of the specifics are different, but in general, they're short, they're dark, they have like a tail, almost like a devil tail. So one of the traditions of the Zaros is they hate the world so much. They absolutely despise the world. And they're in the core of the planet trying to saw down the world tree. And if they're able to cut it in half, the world is destroyed. But every year, during the 12 days of Christmas, which oddly enough, I thought was the 12 days leading up to Christmas. It's actually December 25th to January 6th, which is, is that even 12 days, really? Yeah, I guess so. So anyways, um, during that, like, they're like, <laughs> hurry up with the sign, boys. Let's get this world tree over with. But when December 25th comes, they, something kind of sparks in their brain and they're like, oh, you know what we should do? We should take a break from trying to destroy the world and go up there and cause chaos. And they're like, great idea. They all scurry to the surface and just like lay waste to stuff. They're basically gremlins. They're basically like mischievous creatures. And then after January 6th, they're like, that was fun. Let's go back to destroy the planet, which I mean, whatever. <laughs> it's kind of a weird myth. They go back down there and in, the, in, in those 12 days, the world tree is healed and they're like, dang, nab it. They get the saw and they start sawing again. Now, I have a couple... Other than the tree having the healing properties of Wolverine, you'd think if it could heal that quickly, it would just heal while it was being sawed. I don't know. But anyways, so... Oh, and another thing that they're noted for having... I just saw this in my notes. They're all men, and they have what's listed as protruding sexual characteristics, which, which means they all have boners. I mean, that's just putting it mildly. It's a bunch of little tiny guys running around with boners <laughs> knocking stuff over. They're gremlins with erections. Also, again, I don't I should have I should have went over my notes before I started this part. Here's another trait, another bizarre trait. They're mostly blind. So we got these blind little dudes running around with boners, knocking over vases, and they talk with a lisp. So I okay, so now, now remembering that. We'll redo our scenario. They're saw the tree. Hey, boys, let's go up there and cause some damage. And they're <laughs> That's... Okay, okay, that's done. That sounded way too... <laughs> way too sultry. I don't think... <laughs> anyways, anyways. Mostly blind, talk about the lisp. Big boners. There's a couple of ways to defend yourself from the Zaros. Oh, and here's an interesting note, too. Across the countries, the names are pretty similar. So I don't know if that's it means anything, but it's kind of weird that it's not like in this country they're called this and this other country they're called like Dangos or something like that. It's a pretty similar name. Anyways, you can protect yourself from the Zaros and their massive erections. They can only count to two. So, I mean, that's kind of a weird limitation. Anyway, so what you do is you leave a colander out on your doorstep and they go, ah, and they can't count past two and they're trying to count the holes and they get stuck and the sun comes up and they have to run back underground. I mean, I, I guess. Couldn't you just put, like, three cloves of garlic? It's, it's such a bizarre weakness. You could also, if you thought that was too ridiculous, you could throw, you could burn your smelly shoes in the fire and the smell will keep away the Zaros. That, that's incredibly effective because it will keep away everyone else in the house. I can't think... There are a few smells, I think, that are worse than 
really, really smooth. There's a lot of smells worse than a smelly pair of shoes, but imagine a smell of burning dirty shoes. That would, I would leave that house. I'd be like, see you later. There's like this little guy with a boner behind the corner. He's like, <laughs> my plan worked. <laughs> I, I, that was fake news. I gave him that idea. And speaking of which, they do hide around the corner. They actually, the Zaros and, and this other country, they have this weird tradition where they hunt adulterers. They're basically the Chris Hansen of adulterers. So if you're cheating on your wife or your husband or whatever, you wait till your wife falls asleep and you're like, oh, the perfect plan. Now I just have to walk across this medieval village in the dark and I can have sex with this other medieval woman. So you sneak out of the house and you don't have any shoes on because you burned them. You sneak out of your house and the Zorro is hanging on like the door thing, the, the door, what's that? The door frame outside your house. And you walk out and he jumps on your back. So he jumps on your back. You have this huge now erection pressing into your neck. Not a very pleasant experience, I'm sure. I've never experienced it. And he hangs on your back and he torments you until, well, two things happen. The sun comes up. So you're like just looking at your watch as he's like, <laughs> he's messing with your hair. You're at the bar drink and they're like, Zaro. He's like, yeah, Zaro caught me cheating on my wife. <laughs> Or you confess to your significant other. And now you're thinking, well, I would just wait till the sun came up. But the thing is, is like once he gets you, he'll do that every day. So every night, I should say. So you, your affair is over. You can't go out to see her anyway. So and there's this weird like vigilante group at that point. The Zorro. It's super weird. And, you know, again, this is one of those things like something like that may have existed at some point. Some little creature. I mean, it, it, this... <laughs> It's funny because you can listen to that and go, that's ridiculous. And then read a book about Bigfoot and be like, well, that's possible. I mean, they exist in the same realm. I don't believe the world tree thing. But there could be these little tiny, they could have been at some point, these little tiny guys running around Southern Europe, you know, whipping people with their dicks. I mean, who knows? Who knows? Really, the world is so bizarre. I don't know if they were so, like, anti-adultery that they, part of their race is to shut that down. But, um, I mean, you know, if you believe in Bigfoot, if you believe in cryptids or ghosts, stuff like that, this, as foolish as this sound, it's really not that far out of the realm of possibility. If somebody told me they found a Zorro bone, a Zorro, <laughs> well, more than a Zorro bone, it's just this dildo sitting in the woods. Someone told me they found a Zorro skeleton, I'd be like, oh, that's cool. Like, I mean, I guess they would be a little more excited than that. What I'm saying is that I don't think it doesn't exist at all. I think these things... I don't, I, I'm not going to bet money they existed. What I'm trying to say is I think the likelihood of something like this existing, this little gremlin type creature existing, is more likely than something like the Yule Cat. I would put it on more of the line of a Bigfoot, which is still kind of like this folkloric legend with no proof whatsoever. And then these little guys. I would love to get a blurry photo, though, of a Zaro, Just like this guy, like, creeping out of his house. And you see this, like, hunched figure. You see, like, a silhouette. And then, like, a good, like, nine-inch silhouette poking out. And he's just like, <sighs> Zaros. That, that'd be pretty dope. They should make a Zaros versus Gremlins crossover movie. I'd watch that. Wouldn't it be PG-13, though? So, we've just focused on two mythical creatures. Which is our paranormal segment, our cryptids. Now we're going to get into the true crime thing. So we're going to shift gears. That was a stupid segue. Uh, this is... Okay, I'm not going to hype it up. So, this is our true crime segment. We're going back to the year 2008. It's Christmas Eve. It's actually 10 years ago today. If you're listening to this episode on Christmas Eve. If not, then that doesn't make sense. There's a Christmas party. There's a ton of people there. You got grandmas and grandpas and aunts and uncles and a ton of kids. Now, the kids are doing what they do. Fighting over the controller. One kid's bored of watching the Rudolph the Reindeer special for the 19th time that season. A couple kids are in the back playing a video game. It was a fun gathering. Everyone was there experiencing the love. But it was time for the gathering to leave. So while the kids were kind of situated in the back of the house, some of them playing video games, some of them watching television, the adults were all getting their coats, standing by the front door. And that's when there's a knock. Was that an effective knock? That was on my laptop here. Hold on. 
Yeah, uh, whatever. You guys know what a knock sounds like. And an 11-year-old girl opens the door. And there, standing in the doorway, was Santa Claus holding a Christmas package. And the little girl turns towards the crowd of people in the house and says, Santa Claus! Santa Claus! Announcing it to the room. And that's when the first shot was fired directly into her head. Bruce Pardo. Bruce Pardo was a man who, by all accounts, was an asshole. He, so he got married, and what he didn't tell his new wife was that he had a child from a previous relationship who was injured in a pool accident and suffered severe brain damage. I believe he was like a paraplegic. And Bruce had kind of abandoned him. And when the wife found out about that, his new wife found out about that, she was, that was the final straw. Because he'd already started doing some controlling behavior. It was a relatively new marriage. And one of the things he set up was she had children of her own. He had a child, but she didn't know about it. And once they got married, he said, if the money for you and your kids, you have to earn. I'll make my money, and then you make money to raise yourself and your kids. And that's really not the point of a marriage. It's about forming a union. But she was like, okay, fine with that. But once she found out that he could be so heartless towards his own child, it kind of made her reconsider who this person was. Now, Bruce Pardo's own mother took his wife's side during the divorce. So they ended up getting a divorce. He ended up having to pay alimony of $1,700 a month. Now he had it in his mind that I'm getting taken to the cleaners. Now alimony can be rough on a lot of people and child support can be rough on a lot of people. I've had a lot of friends who've had to deal with that and it totally sucks. There's a good way to deal with it and there's a bad way to deal with it. Now Bruce Pardo is one of those guys that thinks he can figure everything out. Thinks he has it all worked out. No one's as smart as Bruce Pardo. Uh, Covina is near, La sorry, we're in the city of Covina as well. I should have said that earlier. It's a suburb of Los Angeles, so it's California. And he's, he's a manipulator. He's, he was ripping off his employer. He was falsely billing hours. He was saying he was working times that he wasn't. And he, so he was even stealing from the company that he worked for. So he was, he was just a scumbag. And when his boss found out that he was ripping off the company, they fired him. So Bruce Pardo comes up with a plan, a quite diabolical plan. He's going to go to a house where he knew that his ex-wife was at and her entire family. And he was going to massacre all of them. He wanted to wipe her bloodline off of the planet. His next step was to then flee to either Mexico or Canada and just disappear. He had money, he had cash strapped to his body, he had cash in his car. He worked out this plan, it was actually fairly complicated, the police still have had a hard time figuring out what it was. He bought a plane ticket to another state, and people thought maybe he was going to go there to disappear for a while. But then he had documents in his car that led investigators to believe that he was going to flee to Mexico. And then some people were saying no, he was going to go to Canada, and they think maybe the plane ticket was to throw people off. Whatever it was, it was an elaborate plan. And I'm sure he thought, this is going to go over, like, I'm the top dog. Nobody pushes Bruce Pardo around. I'm going to pull this off, and I'm going to get away. And I'm going to laugh about it. Now, of course, we're reporting on it, so we know the plan didn't work. But the way the plan didn't work is, the story stuck with me for a reason. I remember reading about it when it happened, and it stuck with me for 10 years. He goes to the house where his ex-wife is at. Now, he knocks on the door in his full Santa Claus suit. It's a cheap Santa Claus suit, which is kind of funny considering he had all this money, he had all this cash. But he goes out and he buys a cheap Santa Claus suit, and it's like a nylon Santa Claus suit. He should have invested in full cloth, but he didn't. He bought a cheapo nylon suit. He knocks on the door, he's standing outside, it's cold, it's winter, and you know in his head he's thinking, here we go, here we go. I'm going to get her back for all of the things she did to me. And then I'm going to get away Scott. Door starts opening up. Sees a little 11 year old girl there. He doesn't care. Anyone who is friends with his ex-wife or related to his ex-wife is destined to die that night. He has a 9mm handgun in one hand, a package in the other, a Christmas package. And he shoots her in the face. She falls back. 
the adults start to react to the initial gunshot and he just opens fire, just indiscriminately opens fire on all all the adults who are standing near their doorway because they're getting their jackets, getting ready to leave. The kids in the back playing the video games are spared the initial volley. He's shooting. People are diving over couches. One woman jumped out of a two-story window. She was on the she was on the next door. You hear a bunch of gunfire. What are you going to do? You're not going to be like, well, I wonder what's going on down there. Are they opening presents already? She jumps out of the window. People are diving for cover. He's reloading. He's shooting. Some of the people are downed. He stood over them and executed them. And then he opens his Christmas package. A homemade flamethrower using racing fuel. And begins just spraying the entire house with flames. Now, it's one of those things. Like, you, I think we can all imagine, uh, not imagine, but all consider the fact that we may get caught in an active shooter situation. Like, we may be at school and we hear a couple gunshots, or we may be at the mall and someone comes in the mall with a shotgun. But you don't think that person is then going to pull out a homemade flamethrower or or a box of snakes or or any other weapon. You just assume that someone's going to start shooting bullets and you can die for cover and you can hope they're going to run out soon or the gun's going to jam or whatever. Or if you have your own weapon, you can take them out. But you don't consider the fact that this guy may have built a flamethrower and shooting flames over the couch that you're hiding behind. Now, the damage was so bad to the house that when the firefighters got there, they said the flames were going up like 50 feet out of the house. It was a massive fire. They didn't know what caused it. They're putting out the fire and they start getting cross reports because the people who had escaped from the house early on called the police and said, someone's in our house and they're shooting people. So you have the firefighters in contact with the police. The firefighters are just trying to put out the fire. The police show up. They're worried that there's a guy with a gun running around. They can't figure it out. Now, the little 11-year-old girl who got shot in the face. So she opens the door and she's looking at Santa Claus. And when she turns to say, Santa Claus, Santa Claus, which was her exact quote, she turns her head back towards the room to announce it to the room. So the bullet hits her chin, like sideways. If she had been looking at him straight on, it would have been a straight shot through her chin into her neck. But because she turned, he just, she's still alive. She's still alive to this day. But nine people died. It took them a long time to even, because they couldn't identify the bodies. They were so badly burned. His ex-wife died, I think, like her grandma and grandpa died, things like that. It was nine people in total dead, four wounded. And, there, and so the kids, other than the little 11-year-old girl, for the most part, the kids were spared. They took off the back. But the police, obviously, like, the, most of the witnesses are burned, or it was Santa Claus. Like, what's going on? They get another report across town of a gunshot, and they race over there. Covina, as it is near Los Angeles, it's a low-crime area. So they hear another gunshot. They get a report of another gunshot across town. I think it was, like, 30 miles away or something like that. They drive out there. To where the gunshot was. There's a car in the driveway. Or on the street. It doesn't matter. There was a car on the street. And they're like, oh, somebody must be here. They go into the house. And there's a man sitting there. Dead. With a self-inflicted gunshot wound. To the head. And a Santa Claus suit melted onto his skin. So what happened was when he started open fire with the flamethrower. What complicated things is there was a fireplace going on at the time. There was a roaring fire in the house in the fireplace. So when he ignited the racing fuel, it basically ignited the air around him and melted the cheap nylon suit into his skin, fused with him. He had second and third degree burns all over his chest, all over his arms. He was half Santa suit. He could rip pieces off. He ripped pieces of the suit off of him because they found that in the car, along with more cash, three more pistols, and it was primed to blow up. He wanted to take out even more people if they opened the car up. It had like a black powder bomb in it. Now, here's a note too. His mom was supposed to be at the Christmas party. 
but she called in sick. She's like, now nah, I can't go tonight. You guys have fun. So he pl- knew his mom was going to be there. He planned to murder her too. Now, the reason why, that's probably honestly one of my favorite true crime stories. And the reason why, and one of the reasons why I enjoy true crime is because it involves so much arrogance on the part of the perpetrator. Whenever you read about true crime, other than people who are just out and out mentally ill, there is so much arrogance and I'm smarter than everyone else and no one can ever catch me and I got this all perfectly planned out. And they just don't think logically. When I'm reading these books about killers or bank robbers and stuff like that, when they get caught, it's intriguing on one hand, but on the other hand, you're thinking this guy is an idiot because he thinks he can do this forever. This guy thought he could get away with it. And what's interesting is he may have for a time, but I can just, I remember reading the article when I finished it. I go, I can just imagine what he was thinking before and after that event. For the days leading up to it, he's fantasizing about wiping his ex-wife's family off of the planet and then sitting in Mexico with a hot chick and a beer. And he's like, ha ha ha, they'll never catch me. They don't even know it was me. They'll just think it was some random guy. And then living his life on as this kind of like badass hero in his world. And then I thought about what happened after he stumbled out of that house with that suit just melting into the pores of his skin and the intense pain he must have been going through. Driving down the road, looking at his arms, crying in unimaginable pain, knowing he can't go to a hospital, he can't get help, he definitely can't get on a plane or drive across the border. Like, all of his plans ended in the instant as his suit started to fuse with his flesh and him just driving up to that house. It was his brother's house. He knew his brother wasn't out of town and stumbling into that brother's house and reality crashing into his head where he realizes that his plan is over. There's only two solutions now to kill himself and put an end to the pain and go out by his choosing like an egotist, or to be arrested and go to prison and be caught by those people who are dumber than he is. I just imagine that car wreck. Like I'm, it's like one of those when you make a big mistake and you're like, why did I, why did I do that? Why did I do that? But um, that added with you're now half nylon. You're a man made of cheap Santa suit. And so he shot himself. I just found that interesting because, again, that's what I love about true crime is that high arrogance thinking you're smarter than everybody else and then that final blow where it turns out that you're not. You're just an average person with delusions of grandeur. Obviously awful that these people got murdered, awful that the young girl got shot, but it really really held all of the things that I like about true crime, which is that hubris that most of these guys have, and then that just falling to earth because of a stupid detail. If he had had a more expensive Santa Claus suit, probably wouldn't have melted to him. That just the sheer heat is what made it just scar him up. Can't board a plane like that. I wonder if you could, actually. I don't think they stop (laughs) burn victim. They're like, Burn victim comes to the airport. They're like, hmm, have you been to any crime scenes lately? But it would probably be a little bit different if you were in line going, ah, 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 my arms, ah. It's probably, yeah. I think they'd probably call the, at least an ambulance at that point. So that was grim. That's true crime for you, though. Sorry about that. You're like, hey, this episode's starting off really good. You got giant cats. You have little dudes with big boners who talk with a lisp, and then you have a guy shooting an 11-year-old girl in the face and setting everyone on fire. But that, again, is probably one of my favorite true crime stories. But we're going to end on a light note. Well, (laughs) light-ish, because this is where we get... It's interesting because, like I said in the beginning, there's a lot of really grim Christmas legends. Now, this isn't obviously as grim as the Covina Massacre, These are more like funny grim. But if you have an aversion to sickles, you may disagree with me. There's one thing that I haven't really talked about on the show. I I don't talk personally about a lot of stuff. And there's one detail that I've left out pretty, um, pretty much on purpose. Now, 
you get the, the your show's called Dead Rabbit Radio. I am partially Irish, and that's where I get the name from because Dead Rabbits was a gang. It was an Irish gang in like the late 1800s in New York City. Dead Rabbit means unstoppable or unkillable. I think it's a fitting name for this show. But more, I, I'm partially Irish, but I'm mostly Basque. Now, Basque is an ethnicity that is between uh, Spain and France. And I'm not going to get into a bunch of Basque history. The reason why I haven't talked about it is because Basque people in general are... I've I've heard it all. I've heard every conspiracy theory about Basque people that were from Atlantis, that were <laughs> from the Nephilim, were, were descended from the evil giants that were destroyed in the flood, but somehow, you know... I've heard that they actually play a part in this story. But, you know, I was like... Uh, that were alien, that were partially alien. The thing, the reason why those conspiracy theories exist about Basque people, because the re- the language is not related to any known language. They think it's one of the oldest l- languages still being spoken. And they have weird, we have weird blood type stuff, you know. The, the, there's really no connection between the Basque people and the other people in Europe. We are kind of the, the oldest people still around who settled in Europe. So... There's a lot of like legends and conspiracy theories. The Inquisition was to to fight the Basque wizards. The Basque people are pagan in general, like they're Christian, but they're actually pagan. You know, so I heard it all, and I was like, you know, because of the topics I cover, I didn't want to announce that earlier. It's not a big deal, but I didn't want to announce it earlier and start getting emails from people being like, "Oh, yes, that is why you have such good insights because your third eye was from this Basque." That it, whatever, dude. Like. People are born the way that they're born. Their ethnicity is their ethnicity. There's nothing special about it. So I never really talked about it. But I got to talk about it this because their Christmas traditions are weird. And one of them is super, it's kind of creepy, actually. So all that being said, now we're going to talk about the Basque people hanging out with giants, hanging out with the Nephilim. Now, maybe not the actual Nephilim, but again... I guess I should explain. Nephilim was a sto- It's basically this race that's in the Bible. These demons had sex with human women and it created a race of giants and heroes of renown is the phrase used in the Bible. So these mighty warriors and these giants who existed pre-flood because they were half human and half demon. And that was the reason why God was like, oh, this isn't good. Like I created earth for humans not for these, like, superheroes, basically. And so he wiped them out in the flood. I mean, and he's like, oh, yeah, yeah, and there's some wicked stuff going on, too. But he had to kind of erase this genetic code from the planet. And that's why he's like, hey, Noah, get on your boat. You know, don't, don't hang out with any giants. Keep your daughters at home at night. And, you know, just stay away from those giant, those heroes of renown. Anyway, so that's what the Nephilim is. And they were generally described as giants. Now, we're going back to Basque country. Now, yes, Basque... So Basque, they have... Okay, I dude, I can't even... I can barely pronounce English, so I'm not going to try to pronounce, like, the countries, the regions, and stuff like that in the native Basque language. But, anyways, so, we're in Basque town. We're in Basque country. And in the old times, in the old, old times, thousands of years ago, there was a race of giants that lived alongside the Basque. And they were called Gentile, or Gentilac, for plural. But the Gentile were these race of giants. They were very hairy. They were about 12 feet tall, massively strong. And they taught the Basque people how to grow wheat. How They taught them a metallurgy, like how to forge metal. And they invented the saw. Not the movie franchise. They invented a saw and they gave it to the Basque. And they're like, this is how you can reclaim the land. And the Basque people are like, oh, that's awesome. These giants would also had a knack of picking up giant rocks and throwing them and building monuments. So a lot of the, like, you'll be crossing a field and there's just a giant rock in the field. They'll be like, oh, that's a genteel through that a thousand years ago. And that's most likely just because the way the earth forms and things like that. Rocks come to the surface, whatever. But... There also are ancient stone structures, and they're like, the Gentiles built that, and you can't be like, well, that happened naturally. It's like, obviously a man-made structure. But the Gentiles had an interesting thing where they'd only live in the mountains, and the Basque people who were very friendly with them, because the whole area is kind of encircled. It's kind of this, it's, not, it's a lot of mountainous region, a lot of sheep herding region and stuff like that. 
the Basque people would be like, hey, why don't you come down and jo- actually live with us in the, in the towns, in the villages? And the Gentile would be like, no, we're, we're just going to stay in the mountains. We're going to live up here. And everything was fine. But one day, there's a bright flash in the night sky. <laughs> and this light shone down across the land. And there's a Basque sheep herder hanging out in the mountains with a Gentile because they had the best weed in the area. They're getting stoned. They're throwing themselves. Okay, that joke was stupid. Anyways, so there's best sheep herders up there, and, and he's like, what is that? And the genteel, they all kind of look at each other, and they go, that means our time on this planet is over. We have to go home. And so the next day, genteel start packing up their stuff, <laughs> their PlayStation. I don't know. They, I don't know what they had. They're packing all their stuff up. They're being bag chair, their lava lamp. Now he's basically just a college freshman. But anyway, so... The Gentile are packing up all their stuff, is what I'm trying to say. And they walk into this monument that they had built, and they go into the planet. But one of them stayed behind, and his name, his name was Olent Zero. And all the giants are walking in, and they're like, hey, Olent, Olent, are you coming? And he's like, nah, I'm gonna stay behind. I've, I've come to like these little humans a little too much. I'm gonna stay here. And they're like, you sure? And he's like, yeah, I'm gonna stay here. He's smoking a clove. <laughs> and then the other giants go into the underground portal and disappear. And the best people are like, why did they have to leave? And why do you want to stay? And Olin Zero, this is so bizarre. This is so bizarre. Olin Zorro turns to him and says, that star up there, that means that a new king has been born. And I want to become a Christian. <laughs> That's super weird. Now, what the, the reason why I find this story weird is that because the Basque culture didn't get exposed to Christianity, they don't even know. Historians have don't know much about like prehistory of the Basque. They don't know much about Basque even when history is be, being written. But exposure to Christianity for the Basque came somewhere between 3 AD and 15 AD. But this legend is far older as far as we can tell, is far older than that. So when the Star of Bethlehem lit in the sky, their ancient race of helper giants, who some people compare to the Nephilim, actually saw the star saying, oh great, now God's man, now God became a human on this planet. Okay, we survived the flood, guys. We lucked out. But we really gotta leave now because (laughs) stuff's about to get real kooky here. So that legend, like, is that did that really happen? I mean, were there, for, there's so many questions about it, and we're not done because it gets even weirder. But were there really hairy giants walking around Basque country? I was reading this article, and they said because the Basque population is so old, because they've been in one location for so long, it's very likely that they had in that area run-ins with Neanderthals or other humanoid species. Like, uh, they're, they they got to the area and then just stopped moving. And that's why the language has very little cross-contamination. So they're like, they in their legends, when they talk about big hairy people, they could have been referring to Neanderthals. Like, in their legends. But, I mean, you know, was there, was there a race of giants there that they ran into and the race of giants helped them? Did they really see the bright star in the sky and go, oh, great. And then just bounce, which really makes you think that, I mean, were they the Nephilim? Because again, that's an old, old, old legend of the Bass people. And it's funny because you imagine hearing that legend growing up or throughout the ages before you had any idea about the story of like the, the manger and baby Jesus and the three wise men. Your culture is telling you this story when they're like, yeah, we used to have these big giants that used to like give us weed all the time and stuff like that. And then one day they disappear because they saw a bright light in the sky and they said a new king's coming and they left. And you're like, oh, that's weird. And then like eight years later, you're like talking to some missionary and he's like, yeah, let me tell you the story about the birth of Jesus Christ. And as he's telling you that story, you're like, what, what the hell, dude? <laughs> like, that's, that's. It would blow your mind because you would think that was just some fairy tale your grandpa was telling you. And then some dude comes and tells you basically the the other side of that same story. Super bizarre. But anyway, so all and zero stayed behind. Oh, and I have to say this too. I have to say this too. So one of the parts of the legend is that the giants were very noble and they go, 
yeah, the new king's coming. We got to bounce, right? And they go down to their crash pad in the middle of the planet with a bunch of Zaros trying to cut down the tree. But there's another legend. Now, this one was obviously written later because the Basque people for a long period of time were quite paganistic. This old blind man, mostly blind dude, was looking up and he's like, oh no, oh no, I know what that is. And people are like, what is it? And he goes, that means Jesus is being born. Oh no, I don't know. People are like, what, why, who is Jesus and why are you so upset? And he's like, you don't get it. You don't get it. Everyone's going to become Christian now. I don't want to become Christian. I don't want to become Christian. And he runs up to the mountains and he tells the Gentiles, he goes, please, I'm just an old blind man and I can't kill myself for whatever reason. I can't kill myself. Can you please lead me to the edge of the mountain and I'll just jump off? And the Gentile was like, well, you really don't want to be a Christian that bad? He's like, oh, no, it just totally sucks, dude. You got to drink like grape juice instead of wine. You can't do anything fun. It totally sucks. I don't know how he knew all that stuff. But anyway, so the Gentile was like, Okay, we'll do that, and then we'll go underground. And the other genteel are like, yeah, that works. They lead the blind man to a cliff, and he falls off, and they're like, well, that was that was kind of sad. And then the entire race of giants turns to leave, and they also fall off the cliff all to their death, except for all in zero. Now, for a race of giants that invented metallurgy, the saw, and the practice of growing wheat, how an entire species can fall off a cliff Quite unlikely. That sounds like a little bit of a retcon to me. But All in Zero did stay behind, and he did eventually convert to Christianity, to the point where he became their symbol of Santa Claus. All in Zero, so in Basque Country, they had this giant fat dude. Actually, I think originally he was just like a giant farmer, and that was who they did Christmas with, because they were like, oh, yeah, the bright, bright shining star in the sky, this giant stayed behind. Now, one of the implements for harvesting wheat is a sickle. So instead of a sack full of toys, all at zero, all at zero, had his sickle. And here are a couple, there's different regions in Basque Country, but here's a couple of their particular traditions. And I want to say, technically, the story I just told you, it is a conspiracy. I might have had to wedge it in there, but it's kind of conspiracy-ish. It's the, what is the truth? <laughs> That's how that works on this show. In one region of the Basque country. They're told. Children are told in the area, you have to come home early. If you don't, all in zero will get you. And they're like, what? <laughs> what? Okay, this doesn't sound fun. An adult would then dress up as all in zero. So it basically put on like a farmer's outfit and chase the children through the street with a sickle until they got home. Now, as fun as that would be for the adult, that's like the movie The Village. That's basically the plot for the movie of The Village. If... The kids, like, around Christmas time, you know how we tell our kids, if you don't go to bed, Santa won't bring you presents. That's that's adorable. And the kid's, like, trying to, like, stay awake, keeping his eye open, and be like, mm, Santa, I said Jesus knows. Mm, Santa knows if you're sleeping or not. And the kid's like, okay, mommy, I want presents, and goes to sleep. In the particular region in the Basque country, they would, if the kid didn't want to go to bed, just sitting in the living room, staring at just a rock wall because they didn't have anything to do. Parent would be like, you got to go to bed. And the kid would be like, later. Like, you got to go to bed. I don't want to go to bed. I want to sit up and look at this rock wall. A parent, the father, most likely, just from the sheer climbing skill that would be needed, would then go and climb outside the house, climb on the roof, and throw a sickle down the fireplace. So the kid's sitting there just staring at the rock wall. And all of a sudden you hear this clang, clang, clang. And you turn and there's a sickle in your fireplace. That means all in zero was going to kill you. Specifically, cut their throats if they didn't go to bed. Terrifying. Terrifying. And then there was, of course, a Christmas saying. A Christmas saying. So here we say... If you're bad, Santa Claus won't bring, bring you presents. In this Basque area, the saying is, if children are behaving badly, all in zero with the red eyes has come to the chimney. If we break the fast, he will cut our throats. That, why would you, I mean, <sighs> that's pretty gruesome. Now, of course, what happened was those traditions fell out of favor for a while. And because they're quite, quite grim. And and what happened was, as the Basque area became more and more Christianized, they bought more into the Yule time, Santa Claus stuff. Nowadays, they've brought back All in Zero, but they've turned him into like a jolly oaf. 
And so some place, some families will celebrate, like some families will celebrate Santa Claus and All in Zero, but now he's just like a big lovable goofball. But they have a All in Zero Christmas song, and it goes to show that old habits die hard. Now, I don't know the tune for this. I actually tried looking it up. I will try singing it as best I can. But again, we'll end our Christmas episode with this. The All in this is 100% real. The All in Zero Christmas song that's still being sung today. Here we go. All in Zero has gone to the mountains to work. With the intention of making charcoal. Now, okay. In the original Basque language, it rhymes. So, you're like, that's kind of cool. He He's making charcoal. When he heard that Jesus has been born, he came running to bring news. There is, there is, our all in zero. With the pipe between his teeth, he sits. So we have this guy. He's like up making charcoal. He realizes, see, and that, again, the legend's still part of the song. He sees the star. He comes down. He's like, hey, everyone. Jesus was born, and then he just sits and smokes. They're like, who the hell is Jesus? You ran all the way down from the mountains that told us that? And he's just smoking it, smoking his pipe. He also has capons with little eggs to celebrate tomorrow with the bottle of wine. Our all in zero, we can't sate him. He has eaten whole ten piglets. Now, <laughs> now, again, we know Santa Claus is fat, but we don't know what his particular diet is. What we've learned about this guy in this song, that he's like, Jesus is here. This is amazing. <laughs> Just ripping these piglets apart with his teeth. Ten piglets, the cutest animal possible. I mean, yes, puppies and kittens are cute too, but piglets are super cute. And it says in this Christmas song that is sung by children that their version of Santa Claus ate ten of them. And you're thinking, okay, maybe he wasn't Ripping them apart with his teeth. Wait till we get to the next part. So it said that we can't say to him he ate whole ten piglets. Ribs and pork loin. So many intestines. (laughs) They're naming internal organs. He's eating out of piglets. The intestines, going piglets being one of the cutest animals on the planet, to the intestines. The feces-filled, grossest organ on the planet. So yes, he was grabbing Babe the Pig and and Wilbur from Charlotte's Web and just, Jesus is here, rejoice. You think I'm exaggerating? Let me finish this here. Ribs and pork loin, so many intestines, because Jesus is born, have mercy. He's eating these piglets to celebrate the birth of Christ. What is up with this? What is up with this song? This is super grim. He's eating baby pigs. He's eating specifically eating their intestines to celebrate the king of kings. Maybe this guy really was a member of the Nephilim. Maybe this guy actually was half demon. Because really, there's no other way to describe that type of celebration. DeadRabbitRadio at gmail.com is going to be our email address. You can also hit us up at facebook.com slash deadrabbitradio. Twitter is at Jason O'Carpenter. Dead Rabbit Radio is the daily paranormal conspiracy and true crime podcast. You don't have to listen to it every day. But I'm glad you listened to it on Christmas Day. If you are, <laughs> it's coming out a day early, whatever. But I'm glad you listened to it this day. Have a Merry Christmas. Have a Happy Holidays. We will be back tomorrow, which this is all getting weird because this is being recorded. Whatever. See you guys soon. Have a good one. <laughs>